pursuits to immerse in the environment, they're really to risk opportunity and employment and relationships. <laughs> they, they really are a very great um, participant in guinea pig, if you will, to, to look at what does the natural world look like on top of a human. So that's where the Surfer Final Project began about a year ago. As I said, on and up. An adventure kind of across the world to find some of the most interesting surfing communities throughout Africa and Europe and the west coast of the United States and back to my home in Hawaii to profile what the microbiome looks like on these surfers and see if we can detect signs of nature on people that are constantly surrounded by it. And um, it, it really was a great project. I'm, I'm completing now, but I'll show you some of the results. We went to uh, Morocco, London, Ireland, San Francisco, San Diego, and back home to my town to explore this idea of how do surfers interact with their natural environment as a proxy for how humans interact with their environment. And indeed, um, this is what we found. We are comprised of a lot of marine bacteria as surfers. Um, a majority of the bacteria found on our skin come from uh, the ocean. We also can detect certain types of microbes or bacteria that are in higher abundances the more frequently you visit the ocean. Additionally, we also were able to detect differences within the surfing populations of Atlantic versus Pacific surfers. So you have the Hugo them uh, surfing in Cornwall. They have a very similar microbiome to guys like Fergal Smith in Ireland, but very different from the strip surfing community or even the San Francisco um, Ocean Beach surfing community. So we can use this technology to not only see that we're different from the rest of the non-surfers, but differences between ourselves. And lastly, I would just like to remind you guys about that office study where we, it's a two-way street. Nature has a fingerprint on us, but we also have these fingerprints throughout the built and natural environment. Um, some of you may not be familiar with some of these molecules, some of you may. Um, to the left, you have some natural um, molecules from bacteria and fungus. You also have things like THC, which some of you guys may be familiar with or not, um, <laughs> found on surfers throughout the globe. <laughs> but what you may not be familiar with, or may, you might be, is some of these other types of molecules, such as avobenzones or octocrylines, which are found in high concentrations of surfers and are a result of our behavior from the use of cosmetics and sunscreens. And literature over the last five years has really helped us to begin to question what is that in the influence on the ecological world, whether it's in inducing poor bleaching through uh, exposures to micro levels of avobenzones or octocrylines, or even new studies that are coming out that are exploring toxicity levels in phytoplankton, which as we know are very big climate stabilizers within our oceans. Um, we also are beginning to see these types of chemicals in the tissues of marine mammals. So a lot of new research is coming out saying that we are somehow these chemical reservoirs that are having an effect on the surrounding environment. And that's really just the main message is that no matter what, no matter what we do, nature is going to be giving something to us. And I think we understand that very clearly, at least the people in this room. But what we maybe aren't discussing within this room is what we're giving back to nature. And are we giving back positive things or negative things? These are yet to be explored. But with this type of research, hopefully this can be, in a very humble way, maybe this can be a tool that you guys can use to empower your, your voice or empower your action through microbiome and metabolomic research. So with that, just like to mahalo Global Wave. Um, also, Save the Wave, Sir Fryer, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited for this <coughs> conference. Also, the people who support me, this level, Kai, and of course, the University of California, San Diego, um, their help is research really possible. Oh, yeah. In Hawaii, I learned to surf there, and um, I'm lucky enough that I get to spend my career studying oceans. And so um, my research focuses on oceans and human health. Um, there are a lot of benefits we get from the ocean, recreation, food, other resources. Psychologically, it's great to look out this window. It just makes me feel good. Uh, but there are also ways that the ocean can cause adverse reactions in human health. And Sam, you're talking about pathogens in coastal waters. Um, microorganisms, as Cliff said, are composed of bacteria, viruses, and protozoa. 
and they are everywhere in the beach environment. So in beach water, there's a million bacteria per mil and 10 million viruses per mil. Um, we spent a lot of time studying the microbiome of the beach, looking at these microorganisms in sand, in water, and sea spray. And the vast majority of these organisms are beneficial and essential for ecosystem health. They're involved in carbon cycling, nutrient cycling, nitrogen cycling. We need them there for the planet to function. Um, but there are rare organisms present that can make people sick, and those are pathogens. Um, this is a little bit of my research. I'm looking at pathogens in the beach microbiome. So there's a map of California. And one of my students drove from Mexico to Oregon sampling beaches as he drove over a few days. And he looked for a bunch of different pathogens. This map just shows the presence of salmonella in some of the samples. And so the red dot means we found salmonella present. Um, and then the other map is of Oahu. We did research there looking at human viruses in runoff entering coastal waters. And each site we sampled, there are 25 of them. Um, there's a different quadrant of a circle. And if it's colored, it means we found one of four viruses, including adenovirus, enterovirus, and two different types of noroviruses. And those all cause gastrointestinal illness. So where do these pathogens come from? We heard earlier about how they can come from raw sewage. Um, in, developing country, in developed countries, like where we are here today, um, raw sewage is not directly discharged into coastal waters. But the infrastructure in the US and other developed countries is aging, so there's a lot of cross-contamination, so that can be a major source. In developing countries, of course, sewage is not controlled, so that's a major source still in those locations, which some of us like to go to to go surfing. Um, Bather shedding is also a source, septic tanks, and runoff, um, and wildlife and human feces. So people practice open defecation. Um, I can remember friends in high school openly defecating in the lineup when they were surfing. Um, I don't know if you know anyone who's done that before. Um, and they're also environmental reservoirs. So the um, picture on the top shows rack on a beach, and rack can be shown to harbor human pathogens that can presumably grow there. Um, and then the bottom image is an aerial photo of runoff coming out of a, um, of a coastal stream, I guess we'll call it a stream in California, off of Huntington Beach, and it was dyed red, and you can see how it spreads right there um, in the surf zone. So these sources are challenging to clean up. Now, there have been a bunch of different epidemiology studies to try to study how swimmer health is affected by poor water quality. And you can't really see it, but there's a global map there. And I put a red circle in different locations where there have been these studies to look at the relationship between health and swimming. And the studies have mainly focused on answering the question, does swimming in the ocean make you sick? And does swimmer illness correlate to fecal indicator bacteria concentrations? So most of these studies have been conducted at beaches that have runoff, bringing contamination into the water, or treated um, sewage being discharged offshore. Um, and most of these studies have been carried out in the developed world, not in the developing world. Um, and the studies all find, more or less, that swimmers are at a risk, increased risk of illness compared to non-swimmers, and illnesses include things like respiratory illness, gastrointestinal illness, skin rashes, ear, nose, and throat problems. And they also find um, overall that risk correlates to fecal indicator bacteria concentrations. Um, so the two questions that always come up about these studies are, do they apply to surfers? Surfers experience a lot more exposure than swimmers, um, spend a lot more time in the water, but they could also have developed more immunity Ryan is going to talk after me and mention a surfer study, but there was one conducted in San Diego recently that did show that these same results apply to surfers as well, at least in that environment. And there's also a lot of controversy about whether the results obtained at one beach <coughs> apply to another beach. But you can't do these studies at every single beach in the world. So I mentioned that fecal indicator bacteria correlate to swimmer illness, and what that means is that there's a relationship like this. So if the concentration of the water quality indicator gets greater, 
So does the risk of illness and swimmers. Um, so this is the basis for um, guidelines for monitoring beach water quality around the world, including California, in the EU, Australia, New Zealand. It's the basis of regulations. Uh, based on these water quality measurements, um, there are over 20,000 beach closures and advisories in the U.S. each year. This is a picture from Huntington Beach. And then they're also used in Europe to determine if a beach is a blue flag beach. And this is a picture of a blue flag beach in um, Portugal when I was there a couple years ago. So one of the things I've been really interested in my career is understanding how nature affects water quality at the beach. So I've done a lot of work to look at how different factors affect beach water quality. Um, so this plot here just shows different time scales of forcing in seconds and the different, um, na different things in nature that cause variability in beach water quality. Things like rip cell mixing, we all experience rip currents when you go surfing. Those actually control concentrations of contaminants along the shoreline. The sunlight, the, the moon, the phase of the moon, seasons, El Nino events, and even changes in treatment in, of wastewater. So I'm going to show you a couple examples of these. Um, I think we, there's no doubt that everyone here knows that rainfall can affect coastal water quality. This is a picture of Imperial Beach showing the plume from the Tijuana River. This is probably the most extreme example of uh, how water, the challenges of bilateral water quality issues, uh, but you can kind of see a brown plume there. Um, and of course, you want to avoid surfing in those conditions. Um, I've also done work to show how the phase of the moon can affect water quality at the beach. So um, this is data from Santa Monica Beach, and it shows enterococci, which is the indicator bacteria I mentioned earlier, um, for about six different years, and the, um, the plot on, the, um, on your left, and it looks really noisy. And instead of plotting it as the day it was collected, if we then collapse the data on the phase of the lunar cycle, we see that water quality is worse meaning that concentrations are higher during the full and new moon. So day 0 and 28 of the lunar cycle and day 14. And this is because of the important effect that tides have, have on coastal circulation and modulating sources of land-based pollution that enter coastal waters. The last example I'll show you is um, the effect of sunlight on fecal nucleotide bacteria concentrations in the surf zone. So this um, data is from Huntington Beach, but we see the same thing everywhere, even at Cal Beach, right behind us, we've seen it. Um, this is two weeks of data. Instead of showing the time series, I'm showing the average concentration each hour of the day for three different types of fecal indicator bacteria, total coliform, E. coli, and enterococci. And hopefully what you can see is that around noon, the concentrations go very low, but they're relatively high in the morning at night. And that happens to be when people like to surf because the conditions are good. Um, so as surfers, we actually might experience worse water quality than people who go to the beach in the middle of the day because of this effect of sunlight. OK, so amazingly, I have one minute left. I'm glad. Um, I wanted to talk about future challenges and opportunities. So first, even in California, where we do a lot of beach water quality monitoring, most beaches are only um, sampled once per week. So there's a really strike, striking lack of data on coastal water quality, especially globally. And my dream um, project would be to travel the world and collect samples along the shoreline of the entire planet, of course, impossible maybe. But there's like no data for Africa on coastal waters. And it'd be really great to have this data to put this problem in the context of other problems as we're trying to figure out which ones are the most important. Um, the, second the second challenge and opportunity is the fact that we're in the genomic revolution, we're in the Internet of Things revolution. Um, it's possible to apply a lot of new technologies to get real-time <coughs> data on coastal water quality. So I work with people at Mbari. This is a, um, a drawing from one of their um, researchers showing ways where we might be able to actually instrument the ocean and get real-time information on water quality. So we're working with them 
to develop new techniques to do this. And the last thing is that we really need to fi fix the problem of urban drool, that water that just trickles off the land and is highly contaminated with not only pathogens, but chemicals and nutrients. Um, so one promising piece of infrastructure is what we call green infrastructure. These are things like rain gardens and bioretention basins that um, are aesthetically pleasing. There's a little drawing of one. And the idea is that urban drool will percolate through it and contaminants will be removed before it's um, then discharged into the ocean. And so my research group is working on new technologies for green infrastructure. Okay, so if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, super stoked to be here. It's, I feel like we're really lucky that we're all at work today. Um, this is a great conference. Um, my name is Ryan Searcy, and I am the Beach Water Quality Modeler for Gila Bay. Uh, we are a nonprofit based out of Santa Monica, and a lot of you may have heard of us from our Beach Report Card program. Today, I want to talk to you about a new tool that we're developing in collaboration with Ali at Stanford, UCLA, um, and funded under a state water board grant. Um, and that's the NowCast system. And we're going to talk about how we can use it to predict water quality and eventually protect surfer health. So why predict water quality? Well, water quality has implications on both you know, multi-billion coast, dollar coastal economies around the world and, more importantly, on our health. And surfers aren't immune, as, as Ali mentioned. Um, the surfer health study done in San Diego last year uh, showed kind of what we probably already know, that exposure to urban runoff contaminated seawater increases the risk of acute illness. And that risk goes up after, uh, after wet weather, right? And the way that we measure this risk is through uh, measuring bacteria. Not the bacteria that Cliff mentioned that's healthy in our guts, but bacteria that Ali is mentioning, indicator bacteria that might indicate the presence of uh, viruses that can do us harm. So now the question becomes, how do we know how much bacteria is, is in the water? And right now, we don't really. Um, there's two issues. Uh, most beaches around the world are sampled only once a week. In California, uh, only 5% of the 500 or so beaches that we monitor here are sampled more than once weekly. So beachgoers are left with a very sparse set of information to base decisions on, on where to go to the beach. The second issue is that the most common and, and widely used methods to figure out how much bacteria is in the water take one to two days to even come back from the lab. And as we know, water quality varies at a much higher rate or a more frequent rate. So by the time we get a sample back from the lab, it's old. So what do we have? We have bad data and not a lot of it. And so what are surfers up to do? Some of us guess, some of us use the three-day rule, right? And while that is somewhat science-based, um, it's certainly not applicable to every single beach in the world. And it really only helps us during periods of wet weather. A lot of us choose to ignore water quality um, and go in even after it rains. In fact, some of us would say that's the best time to go because there's nobody else out. Right? Um, and nobody should be telling us you know, when to go and when not to go. We should make the decisions for ourselves. But the information needs to be out there to give us a fair chance, right? And so what's needed is water quality information that's available every day, that's accurate, and it's easy to access and easy to understand. And so our NowCast system predicts water quality um, on a daily basis and makes these water quality predictions for beaches across the state of California. And the predictions come from statistical models that are calibrated on years of bacteria and environmental data. And these models are more accurate than relying on a day's old sample alone. And they're pretty easy to understand and access. You can go onto our platform, check the beach that you care about, figure out what the NowCast is, make your decision, and like this person is doing, um, go out and rip, right? So digging into predictive modeling. Um, predictive modeling or machine learning is everywhere now, right? It's in our facial recognition software in our phones. It's in the ETA that we get when we go on Google Maps. It's how we're advertised to. Monterey Bay Aquarium, as, as uh, Kyle mentioned earlier, is using it. And it's also being used to predict water quality. And there's been a lot of research efforts around the world to do this. Places like the Great Lakes, um, the UK, New Zealand, Puerto Rico, Croatia, Germany, um, and now here in California. 
And we're doing it on the biggest scale that's been done before and at some of the most populous um, and popular beaches in the world. So our project uh, began as a research effort a couple years ago, led by Ali and her team, um, to figure out a couple things. One, can we create models that accurately predict bacteria? And two, if we can do that, can we actually implement this on a daily basis and make an effective program? The findings were one, yes, we, we can create accurate models. And those models are unique, not only to the different beach types and beach locations that we're predicting for, but also the bacteria type that is being predicted. And two, that these, this program can be implemented and supplement existing monitoring programs uh, alongside existing <coughs> monitoring programs, I should say, um, at quite a lower cost than it would be to sample every single day. So to create a model, uh, I'm going to give you a, a cluttered data photo as well. Um, you start with a lot of that, a lot of data, eight to 10 years of bacteria environmental data. Bacteria data comes from our collaboration with the public health agencies around the state. And that is what our models are predicting. That's the target we're shooting for, right? The environmental data is what explains what happens to bacteria on a day-to-day -day basis. Things like tides, and stream flow, and weather, and waves. And that data is really easily accessible, a lot, at least a lot more accessible than bacteria data, which, again, I explained there's, there's issues with getting that data. And we plug that into machine learning uh, models, or machine learning algorithms, and we spit out models that can predict water quality on a good to poor basis. And we're able to calibrate our models to predict both good days and poor days as accurately as possible. And so we do this for a number of beaches, and what we're left with is an ensemble of, of models that are based on years of data. So you can think of predictions as capturing what the central tendency of water quality is based on observed environmental conditions that we've witnessed over the last 10 years. Compare that to a single sample, which is highly variable, and we don't even know what it is until two days later. So these models are run using an automated system every morning at 7 a.m. Um, we pull environmental data from the web, plug it into these models, spit out the predictions for the various beaches, and deliver it to public health agencies, and post it on our beach report card app and website platforms. But the hallmark of the program really is is that this information is available on a daily basis, every single day of the season. In 2017, last summer, we modeled 10 beaches um, from uh, April through October, the uh, legal defined swim season in California. And in that time, you can expect an average of 28 samples to be taken out of each. Um, scale that up to about 300 samples throughout the, the year. We made 1,850 predictions, giving beachgoers much more water quality information than they would have gotten with sampling alone. At Cal Beach right here, we provided an additional 124 days of water quality information. At Redondo, an additional 151 days of water quality predictions. And at Doheny Beach, where every time we predicted the water quality to be poor, they took a sample to see if we were right, we even predicted 163 additional predictions. So these models are accurate, and we can make them work and implement them properly. So we're looking forward to growing this program um, and expanding uh, to more and more beaches. So wrapping up, you know, as surfers, we continuously are considering all the variables before we paddle out. And we have tools to do this, right? We, we can check the weather, we can go on Surfline or Magic Seaweed and check the waves, we know what the tides are. But we don't really have a good tool right now for water quality. But the Nowcast system can be this tool. It, it provides daily predictions that are uh, accurate and easy to understand and access. And there's so much potential to grow the program to more beaches and even on an international scale. But if, if we're going to do this, we're going to need a bit of help. Um, our grant is ending at the end of the year. So we need the support of people like you all to, um, to help us. So if you're interested in uh, making sure that surfers catch only waves and not stomach flu, um, let's have a conversation. Thank you. To, um, my talk to the studio said he would rugby tap me at the stage before I go over 10 minutes. Um, and I'm going to go back to the Global Web Conference in 2015, where I spoke there and I came with a few clear messages. The first was that it is imperative to collect data on your surf breaks, otherwise you can't manage and protect them effectively. Um, except it wasn't clear because I forgot to say it when it came to the very crescendo of 
my uh, talk. So with uh, the latest video editing techniques and a crack team working on it around the clock, we have uh, part of my talk again, version two. Oh, come on, guys. <laughs> Should we try again? Yeah. Doesn't work without sound. I don't have subtitles. What did you say? Eh? <laughs> no, now I'm going to go over 10 minutes. <laughs> Should we try again? Yeah. All right, okay. So I basically went on this rant about how you really need to collect data and um, and then forgot to actually say it when I was saying what's really important and I just started going on about all kinds of different things. So I made this great video for you guys to see and it's not there and anyway, it's really important to take data people. Um, so now three years on, nearly three years on, lots more hair, I finally got closure on that. Um, and uh, yeah, so the second point was uh, that we had, we started a new project to go out and collect data on surf breaks in New Zealand and that's what this talk is about. Um, it's called Remote Sensing Classification and Management Guidelines for Surf Breaks of National and Regional Significance, and that is a mouthful and a half. I just call it the MB Project, which is the, the body uh, that funds the project, the Ministry of Business, Employment and Innovation, no, Innovation and Employment, and it's a project, three-year project in conjunction with the University of Waikato with specialists such as Dr. Terry Dean, Dr. Sean Mead, Associate Professor Karen Bryan, and Dr. Jordan Whitey. Um, the impetus was exactly that. We had no data. It's really important to get data, but basically, without baseline data, we are not upholding the intent, the intent of the very policies put in place to protect our resources, and in this case, um, surf breaks. So, we kind of broke the project into six components, and that's what I'm going to whiz through today. Um, study site selection, uh, collation of local and existing knowledge, um, physical data collection, data analysis, uh, the dissemination of data, and then the development of guidelines, which should warn you now that this isn't particularly water quality, uh, quality orientated, but it is in the, the rich to reef um, sphere. So our seven study sites were chosen with a decision-making matrix, um, which included lots of different components, um, and the study sites of Piha, Manu Bay, which is Ragnan, uh, Fongkar, Wainui Beach, Lyle Bay, and Aramoana and Fariaki Aki down in Otago. And we feel that these surf breaks are representative of the surf break demographic in New Zealand with lots of different types of, of uh, surf breaks. At each study site, we went and held stakeholder engagement where we just invited everyone along to come and garner as much information we could about those surf breaks. Um, because local surfers are actual ex they're proper experts on their surf breaks, and you, you just don't know if you don't surf at a place whether. Uh, what's going on there and so we put out these posters and people were doodling all over them and we were um, yeah, getting heaps of information and then we, we combined that with literature reviews um, and geophomological assessments whilst we were there and just I'm not going to get into heaps of detail about what we got out what we got out so far but the really perceived threats were quite interesting so this is PIHA um, and some of the perceived really perceived threats are quite obvious and others not so much that, one of the main concerns there is that because we've got a planting program, um, the beach is accreting, the, the sand binding species are locking up sand, and that accretion in the beach is actually being, is detrimental to the surf break. This is what locals believe. Um, as soon as you start doing hard uh, engineering activities in a coastal environment, you do have the potential to um, uh, affect um, not just the surf break, but the wider environment. So marine construction, port expansion, and disposal of material, Boat ramps, breakwaters, this is Manu Bay, we have a breakwater and a boat ramp in the final third of the wave. Uh, runway extension, very extreme. Uh, and, then, and then the water quality. And in New Zealand, we talk about water quality as in sewage and things like that, but there's real concern about land use, so the catchment behind the surf break, what's being done there? And in most cases in New Zealand, it's farming. Not so obvious, the sharing of space. So you have um, surfers and boaties accessing the same point and that can lead to conflict. But then you might have people that have their, the surf break is their refrigerator and, and that's where they're going to get seafood, kind of water. And then finally, how the voice of local surfers is heard during the decision making process. And this is a legitimate concern because it's generally not. So on to the more hardcore data collection. Uh, we use video imaging systems, we built our own system um, so that we completely control what we were collecting. Now this system 
is up in six sites. Um, we've got one more to go, which I've got to do when I get home. Um, this is Lyle Bay, no, Mandy Bay, Lyle Bay, Piha, uh, Wainui, Aramoana, Bariaki Aki, and these uh, imaging systems get 1,200 images every hour, every day, all year long. And what we do to make these useful is something called geo-rectification. So in the field of view of the, of the image, we get ground control points, and we can twist and distort the image, like the one below here, um, and create a pseudo bird's eye view, and that gives us some, some idea of this in the space domain. And we can start to pull out features such as shoreline change and wave propagation characteristics. But when it comes to surf breaks, we're interested in certain wave quality, and the parameter we use is the PL angle, the angle between the unbroken wave crest and the um, uh, line of white water of broken waves. And so we are developing systems that are taking these images, rectifying them. They're automatically identifying the crest and the white water, and we are recording that value, and that's your baseline data. This is what this surf break is like on this day through time. And we're also looking at um, uh, assessing the accuracy of big wave surf heights. It's an, it's an adjunct to the project, um, but quantifying our big, surf, big wave surfing heights and, and how accurate that can be with similar um, methods. Next stream data collection is. Um, it's hydrographic surveys, um, so we go out with a jet ski and we do lots of soundings and we can create a map of the sea floor because wave breaking is depth limited, so um, we need to know what the shape of the sea floor looks like um, to understand why it's breaking the way it does. Now if we were these surveys, surveys, we can see how that sea floor changes over time. And then if we compare the, those, um, the, the changes over time to the environmental drivers, we get a really good handle on on why the, break, why the break does what it does at different times of year, and that's also part of our baseline data set. What we can also do with the, with the depth data is plug it into numerical models where we can look at the, the influence of offshore features, but it's not just in the near shore, we need to look further afield. So whilst, um, so that image on the far side is a swell corridor for Fon Matar, and, um, and whilst we talk about ridge to reef, really it should be um, ridge to continental shelf. Um, but it uh, doesn't sound good, does it? Um, and then with the numeric models, we can start looking at ride lengths, um, breaking intensity, so the shape of the waves, and again, the peel angle. And then the final um, data collection method as part of the project is uh, with the Ripco GPS watches. Ripco were kind to that fund to donate 21 watches, which we took to our stakeholders, uh, to the meetings, and handed them out so we had riders, local riders, that were sort of identified as being competent. Um, collecting data in, the, in, in, the, in, in our study sites. And I'm not going to get into any great detail because on Wednesday, Jose Barrera is going to be giving a detailed talk on what uh, amazing applications you can do with the data. Um, but in terms of this project, spatial definitions of the surf break, so what's our surf break area? And then we can use it to validate our models, our numerical models, um, and also validate um, our image analysis um, techniques. So the dissemination of data, we have a website up and running, kind of gives a background to the project, but right now we're working on a, a GIS, -E, geographical kind of uh, um, database where you can click on a surf break and all of the scientific literature related to that surf break will come up. Um, and all of the studies we do and all of the data that we've collected, it's all going to be pushed out there for anyone to use. And then the last component, developing the guidelines, and probably the most important component of the, of the whole project is, is we want a document that um, can be used to aid the decision-making process. We want, we want um, to provide methods on how we quantify surf breaks and establishing tolerance levels for them, um, how, how you assess potential threats and then provide miti mitigation uh, options for them, um, specify min minimum study requirements, and then underpin this with case studies from each of our study sites. And the hope is that the guidelines will be picked up by um, councils, regional, national, um, the NGOs and environmental groups, but also the prospectors, developers, the guys that are doing the coastal activities, um, so that that whole um, pathway becomes a lot clearer because it's been kind of muddy um, and opaque uh, previously. Um, now, that was uh, a whistle stop tour of the project. If anyone wants to come talk to me about it, uh, please do. I love talking about this subject. And, uh, Hopefully at the next level we're confident so about keynote, hey guys, and uh, I can give you a massive summary, uh, massive summary of the whole project, which will all be wrapped up. Um, so thank you for listening. Sorry about the video, if you are.